Right. right. But but also, um, uh, before I start with the past papers, let me hear if there are any things that initially you all need some clarification on. And I'm assuming that you had a chance to at least look at some of the past papers uh, already. Right. So um, I'll leave the floor open as we start and, and then go ahead from there. So the floor is yours. Um, things for uh, uh, clarification at this point. Anything that is very unclear or or that you just want to um, streamline the answer. Hopefully the past paper solutions have been, if you've started and, and I, hope you, I hope you have been trying them already, that, um, that, that they um, are reasonable. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, Samantha says she doesn't have any, anybody else has any particular things at this point in time? Okay, um, well, feel free to interrupt. Uh, um, as I said, the approach will be to kind of go through the, the, the past papers um, just quickly on, on the solutions. If you've tried them and you're not getting the answer, um, then uh, anyway, I'll comment on that as we go along, right? But so, so if you have anything that suddenly pops up, let me know and let me just run through what, what we have at this point. Okay, so. Um, Share here. So at this point, I have the. This would be the. Hold on, let me see. This would be the 2009 paper. Things got a little haywire here. Just not, let me see if I could figure out where my where the 2009 question is. Good. Right, so the 2009 question, um, or question paper, um, this one, if you'll notice, it is a scenario type, uh, and I vary it. Um, sometimes I just ask this question straightforward. Um, at times, the questions were asked in, in, a, in a sort of scenario. But if you look at it inside of here, you will see the sort of things that we discussed uh, as we went through before. Um, so we have filters here. You will see the spike removal filter, low pass filter. You will see FIR filter, STFT, which is short term Fourier transform. You will see spectrogram here, right? Um, and you see IIR filter, and you see reference waveform. So everything in the course is, is, is basically asked at this point in time. Right, and the first part of the question was, of course, uh, the, the 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 spike removal filter had to do with a third order moving average filter, and if you remember, which was everything that we had done before and in the subsequent papers, the spike removal filters usually are just you what what you want spikes are high frequencies, um, sudden high frequencies. That, that distort the signal. And a simple way of getting rid of that is to use an easy low pass filter. And the easiest low pass filter that they can construct is a moving average filter. And all it simply does is averages three consecutive, no, not three, uh, averages N consecutive terms as you go around. So it's a moving average, it's always taking N from the current um, instant to um, go back um, n times. So if it's a three, well, n minus one time. So if it's a, a third order moving average filter and you're at this point and, and you're at point x, it will take point x, point x minus one and point x minus two and average those three, right? If it's a fourth order, it would have gone, gone back one, one, um, one before and so on, right? The transfer function, um, this question is asking you to show that the transfer function is of, of this form. And remember, I said, or we derived it in class in, in, in the lecture on that, that for an nth order moving average filter. So if it was eight order, 
there's a way, and I wouldn't ask you to do this because, but, but, but they, they, it is there, right? For an eight order moving average filter, the transfer function here will be one over eight, one minus e to the minus eight g omega over one minus e to the minus g omega, right? So, so that they can show that the, the, the frequency transfer function for any order moving average filter is that in the case of the third order, moving average filter, you start with Hn, which will be um, Hn plus Hn minus one plus Hn minus two divided by three. And then you take the Z transform and then you substitute Z equal E to the J capital omega. And then you make a little um, substitute, you make a little, um, uh, what do you call it? You divide if you like a little um, algebraic manipulation where you divide the answer by one minus e to the minus j omega and you get it in this form, all right? The solution um, showed that, I believe this was the solution here, right? So there you start with the transfer function, take the Z transform, simplify, substitute Z equal e to the, e, e, e to the j capital omega inside of there and then you take this, you take this, and you divide it by the um, one minus e to the minus j omega, and that's it. As you saw, the breakdown for the how how the marks were allocated. Um, it was basically five steps, so you got a mark for each step as you went through. Okay. For the um, other part, part B. Okay, so you wanted to remove frequencies above. above 250 and the sampling frequency is 1.5 kilohertz, right? So the cutoff frequency is 250. The sampling frequency is 1.5 kilohertz. So the number of terms for the moving average filter in this particular case would be in, in the case for part B is FS over FC. So that means you need a sixth order filter. A sixth order filter the input output or the difference equation, I think it asked for that. Right, what is the difference equation to, to, to um, achieve that? The difference equation, it's a six order, it means it's averaging six terms. So Xn and then the five previous terms. And of course you have to divide by um, six, all right? And then the last part for that um, particular question, was asking you, oops, I think I closed off the, 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 the was asking you to draw the, the, the frequency response of it. And um, I should have really said, the, the question had a little bit of an error, but I should have really said the answer to part B, which was a sixth order solution here. Um, but if you did answer for, for part A, which was a third order, the, the frequency response would have looked like this. Remember the response has, if it's an even order filter, you have the whatever is the Nyquist frequency line. And if it's an even order filter, you have half a lobe and two complete lobes before um, the Nyquist. If it's an odd order filter, you have half a lobe and a half a lobe again. In other words, the, the Nyquist frequency divides one of the, the, the final lobe and so on, all right? Let me see if I can retrieve this. Hold on, let me just get back that, that um, problem set here. Right, so in the meantime, anybody, um, On any questions, I just lost the solution for that one. So, oh. Okay, so let me just here. Give me a second to retrieve the, the question paper.
Anybody try that? Um, try that question and, and had some issue or, or need some clarification. All right, that's not. Here we go. Okay, so that was question one. Okay, for part C, hold on a second, let me get my solutions back. You know, it disappeared so quickly, but one second. Right, there we go. All right, good. So I can stop back sharing here again. Good. And the last, right, so that was part C. And then part D now, right, the ECG obtained upstairs um, is filtered by passing through a low pass filters whose impulse response is given by figure Q1D part two. Calculate the output ECG after passing through the filter. This is testing um, a convolution. If you remember, um, whenever, from, from what we were saying, anytime you pass a signal through a system, what you do is to convolve the impulse response of the system with the signal. So this is a convolution question. So it's asking you to convolve the ECG on top with the impulse response below. So what it asks, so what was expected is that um, if you take the signal and, and you and, and you look at the impulse response. The impulse response sampling period is one second. So therefore, at one second intervals, you have HN, which was given. You take XN and you take the samples every one second, and then you put it in a convolution table and calculate the answers, whatever those answers happen to be. OK? All right. Next question um, was about um distortionless transmission and fir filters right um so i expect you to understand what is distortionless transmission and uh, first of all uh, of course the distortionless transmission means that when you send a signal through um a filter or any system that what comes out is uh, at most um a delayed or um, amplified or attenuated version of what went in there's no phase change or if the thing has multiple frequencies, that there's a constant phase change uh, um, in, in relation to the frequency, right? So everything is summarized here. The system does not, is not affected, uh, does not affect the signal form. It could be scaled, it could be delayed. And this requires that the system has a constant phase delay. So in other words, if I were to draw, if I were to draw um, the, 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 the um, the system magnitude response against the phase angle, you would get a constant negative slope straight line. All right. And then we use FIR filters for this because the particular structure that they have, which is a symmetrical transfer function, exhibits um, that constant phase relationship. All right. This, so to show that 
which is question in part B, and this is straight from the notes. If you want to show that this results in a linear phase behavior, then you have to redefine, you look at the, 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 um, the um, transfer function, you make it symmetrical. So you have to multiply everything by Z minus two. In other words, you want it symmetrical about this central term here. So if you delay everybody by Z minus two, you get the transfer function in this particular form. And if you substitute um, Z equal E to the J omega, and then simplify, the equation has only real valued parts. There, is no, um, there are no imaginary parts in, in this, so that the phase angle, because it's a real valued answer, there, there's, no, um, there's no phase component of it. And all we do by Z minus two, if you remember that Z minus two produces a constant phase delay on all the signals. That's all you do. Z minus two is a time delay. Time translates into a phase delay. Okay, so everybody, um, so the linear phase relationship is maintained um, even if the, the transfer function looks like this, which is symmetrical, if you delay everybody and you get it into this form where um, it is symmetrical about some central value here, that the coefficients B and B, A and A, if you had a D and a D and so on, are symmetrically um, distributed about a central value. All right? And then this one, how the, the, the part C was to implement it using a nine point humming window and a sampling frequency, right? And two questions came up, I saw on the Google Doc, both, both related to this. The first one is that, okay, if you're using a nine point humming window, right? To maintain the symmetrical transfer function behavior that we have here, if it's nine point, it, it is going to have to run from minus four to plus four, including zero, right? So the number of terms will be minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one. The, que the first question in the chat, of course, was that this function or this equation for the Hamming window was a little bit different than what we learned when we were talking about the Hamming window specifically. And the reason, of course, was that when we introduce a humming window um, in, a um, in, in, in the middle of the semester, that n ran from zero to n minus one. But when we're doing it, when we're using the humming window to design a symmetrical filter, n runs from um, some minus m to plus m and is symmetrical about zero. So in order to accommodate the minus in the negative indices, the sign on the Hamming window changes from a negative to a positive, all right? So when n is negative and the cosine value comes in, you get the correct value here with the, the, um, with the sign. That's answer number one. The second part is that you start the, the, the design, if you remember, you start the design of the, um, the filter by assuming an ideal uh, um, what do you call it? An ideal low pass performance, right? In the in time. So so the ideal the ideal transfer function in time. Let me see if I could, could do it here. Right. So the ideal tran uh, um response in time looks like this. This is what the, um, the response would look, sorry, the, the, the ideal frequency response looks like this. this is what an, ID, um, an ideal low pass filter would look, right? So it passes and, it, and at some cutoff frequency, it does this. But of course, when you do this in frequency, the time response is a sync function. All right, so that when we when we starting with a humming window design, we assume this ideal, but then we have to convert this to the sync function, and this is where the when when we go back in. So let me stop this here now. So when you go back to the um, when you go back here now, so the time sequence 
is a sync function because they are, because they're dealing the ideal frequency response looks like this. So the time sequence that um, produces that is a sine x over x function. All right, and the sine x over x function that I I told you all to remember was h n sine two pi n f c over f s over pi n. It's a ninth order, so n is running from minus four to four. And I asked you all to remember this particular bit, right? That I'll stop this in a while to get rid of that. Right, that at n equal to zero, at n equal to zero, the sine x um, h n, right? Sine x over n is one at n equal to zero. In this particular case, because you have um, sine two pi f c over f s inside of there, the value is a little bit off one, but it is not zero, right? Once you have the 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 um, your calculator in in radians, of course, if you put it in, you're going to get zero, of course. But you have to remember that the sine function at at um, n equal to zero is will be two pi. If you put it here, two pi n. Well, at zero, the n's cancel, so it will be two pi f c over f s over pi. All right, it is not zero. The sine x over x function is actually one. All right, if this was if this was sine pi n over pi n, this would be one. Okay, the ends at 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 as you approach zero, the sine function becomes equal to two pi n f c over f s as this approaches zero in radians. So the ends cancel, the pi's cancel. So you really have two f c over f s in this case. All right. Everybody okay with that? All right. Um, just remember, give me a second here. I can't see the chat all, all the all the time. All right. So if you if you want to ask me something, um, you need to. You're right. You need to, um, to, to um, what do you call it? Um, draw my attention to it, right? Okay, because I, you can put it up in the chat, but um, I am watching one laptop or, and, and the one with the chat is on the side, but I wouldn't see it, you have to say something, all right? Okay, so let's go on here. I have to get rid of this thing um, somehow. Yeah, give me a second here, let me see. Half a second. Right, I have written up on the screen and I'm not too sure how to get rid of it. Okay. Okay, All right, so that takes care of, of that one. Anybody um, still not clear on that? All right, and another, well, while I'm waiting, in, in case you have any questions on that, sometimes in the solution you might see, I, I make mistakes too when I'm writing up the solutions as I, I mentioned to you. So I, I do the questions, I do the answers, I double check, but then I have to send it up to, to exams for a particular time. Occasionally, I make some errors, and I'll see the errors when I start to mark the papers. And at that point in time, I'll, I'll change my solution to the correct ones and, and, and so on, right? Work over any answers or, or any misconceptions. Sometimes people answer, um, like, like for instance, in, in, in um, question one here, right? When I had um, the draw label diagram showing the full frequency response of the moving average filter derived in part C. I noticed that that um that that some people actually responded to, to this question here, and I kind of I mean this one is fairly fairly straightforward. It shouldn't have of of um um it should have been part A here, right? In derived in part A, I have parts here. I didn't pick up that. So some people gave me the the answer for part A. Some people gave me the answer for part B. Okay, my 
my solution actually had the answer for part B, but when that's the case, I'll actually, uh, uh, if it was something that wasn't clear, right? I wouldn't penalize people, but but my my solutions that I publish would still have the original answer in it, okay? So same thing for correction. So occasionally you might come up with a slightly different answer than the one I have here. Um, if that's the case, just let me know and I'll, co I'll confirm that it, it was an error in what I did, all right? Okay. Um, this particular part of the question asked about the short-term Fourier transform. What is it and what type of applications we use it for? Remember that had to do with signals where the um, they, they, they frequency content varies with time. Also called the stationary, um, um, sorry, non-stationary signals. Okay, so they can't apply the Fourier, the, the FFT to the entire signal you have to look at it one little bit at a time. And that involves um, breaking it up into smaller samples, into a smaller group. And, and of course, when you when you sample something, you just can't use a regular rectangular window with it because then you get leakage because of the sudden changes and so on. So you have to use a sampling window. And the FFT is now applied to this smaller group. And then you move it to another, um, you move it, along the signal in, in little chunks at a time. And then you combine all of the answers into one image, which shows everything. It shows time, it shows, uh, sorry, it shows frequency. Um, it shows, um, yeah, time, frequency, and amplitude um, on, on the three axes, okay? Next part, all right, so how that is produced. Um, right, the SFT, well, this one was just, um, now you have a 32-point FFT. Calculate the values of the twiddle factor for the output stage is only of the 32-point FFT. And draw any one butterfly operation for the output stage. If it's a 32-point FFT, okay, you have to have 32 twiddle factors. And all of them are going to be multiples of magnitude one angle, um, uh, minus two pi over 32 or minus 360 over 32 degrees, however you want to look at it. And N is going to go from naught to 31. But of course we saw because of the symmetry, um, the only twiddle factors you really have to use are the, uh, from N equals zero to 15. After that, the other ones are um, just the, the mirror image of those. One second. All right, so um, you can, all right, so, so, so the twiddle factors, for instance, would be the first one would be one, of course, then the next one would be one angle minus 11.25, which is 0.98 um, minus J.195. And so you keep going on um, for it, all right? Um, Calculate the values of the twiddle factors. So you just have to you have to do 16 of them. And then the output, the, the output stage, remember the output stage for a 32 point FFT, they, they, they will be combining two 16 point FFT answers. And the butterfly operation will be like this. The output, remember this is the even one and the odd one. So it will be um the up the 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 Upper 16, the first one will be combined, added to the first value of the second of, of the lower 16 point, and the twiddle factors used, of course, will be W032 to W1532 for that one. Okay. All right, this was a um just some additional. Of course, you're not expected to produce anything like this in the um, in the exam, this was just the, the answer based on the slides that we had. Okay. I did, as, as I said, the diagram is not, not, not repeated. Question four. Right. This one was just about the, the, the implementation forms. 
of the transfer function, direct form, canonical form, cascade, and parallel. So to draw the diagram for that, and I straight from the notes. So the direct form, if you have the, you, you write the transfer function, of course, you, you write the standard form of the transfer function, which will be, um, you know, they, 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 if you, if you look, for instance, here, uh, the coefficients of the numerator are the b's, so b0 plus b1, z minus 1 plus b2, z minus 2, et cetera, et cetera. The numerators of the, of, of the, the coefficients of the numerator are b is the coefficients of the denominator is 1. Just now, just let me take this call a second, one second. Right. Apologies. Okay, so so the direct form, if you have the transfer function, this is just a second order example here. But if you have the transfer functions, remember the transfer function has a feed forward, which are all the parts dealing with the B coefficients, and a feedback, which is all the parts dealing with the A coefficients. The direct form literally maps it like that. So you have all the Bs summed, and then all the A's summed. Okay? Um, the, the, the direct form, the di sorry, this is a direct form. The canonical form realizes that B multiplied by A and A multiplied by B is the same thing. So if we swap the order, if we change the processing sequence of this, then we can eliminate a set of delays, repeated delays, and we get it in this form, which is a direct form realization or implementation of the transfer function. What this does is that it means that if you're processing this on, 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 a, uh, on a system, you only have to have one set of storage um, storage elements because each delay thing means you have to scroll hold a value. So it, it cuts your storage requirements by half, right? The cascaded system, when you factorize, if you take a transfer function and you factorize it into smaller transfer functions, so it's H1 multiplied by H2 multiplied by H3. And so, so that whatever it comes in goes, is processed here, then processed here, then processed here, right? That's a cascade form realization. And this is, we use this too for, for, for instance, in implementing high order filters. So if I want to implement a fifth order filter, instead of having one fifth order transfer function, right? what I could have is a first order transfer function followed by two second order transfer functions. That will give me my fifth, right? And you use a lot less storage space. And these are the kind of, this is the kind of situation that you will, um, you would want to consider if you're dealing with things like embedded applications where memory space is an issue. Right, it is slower in processing because they have to do one thing, then the other, then the other event, and until you get the, the final answer. If speed is an issue, then what you do is to do the, the processing in parallel. So they break the transfer function up into partial fractions, which is this plus this plus this, and you add up the answer at the end. So it does all of um, the processing together, and you add up the, the answers at the end. This is quicker 
because everything is being done at the same time and then you just add up the answer, all right? Then, right, part B now had to do with um, how to create an in infinite impulse response filter, right? And remember, there were two ways to do it. One was to match the, um, the frequency response, which is the bilinear transform, and the other one was to match the time response, which is the impulse invariant method. Um, if you remember, again, and, and we derive this from our um, signals and systems, the impulse response is a transfer function of a system. So if I make, if I have a transfer function that has a particular frequency response, if I duplicate that transfer function in the discrete domain, then the frequency response will be the same. In other words, I'm, I'm copying transfer functions. In the case of the bilinear transform, what we do is to make a substitution um, using the, the, the relationship between S and Z. Right, and and once we do that, um, then we we um, we we get a, a a filter that behaves. It's an approximation, but the frequency response duplicates what the um what the frequency response of the analog filter did. Right, we duplicate that in the discrete domain. Of course, the phase relationship goes to hell. It's all over the place. Okay, and so if you're looking to match phase relationships, you do not use infinite response filters. You use the finite response. And this one, the solution steps are generic all the way through. You start off with some transfer function that you know, and then you decide how you want to match it. So I want to match the 10 Hertz cutoff frequency for this to 10 hertz in the digital domain. And I'm mapping it by replacing S up here with some constant Z minus one over Z plus one. And the constant, you have to remember this, is two pi FA, right? Two pi FA is the, this and FA is the analog frequency here over tan pi F over Fs. F is a cutoff frequency here. So Fa is 10 hertz. F here below is also 10 hertz. So if you do that, right, if you do that, then um, you, you, can, you will get that C is 193. Some people responded is it, two is two pi FA over tan 0.5 omega. Okay, so so um, that's, you, you will see that in the notes. So however you want to remember it, remember C. Okay, up to you. you. You remember it however you need to. Once you do that, you calculate C is 193. So HZ is going to be, wherever I have S in here, HZ is now 193 Z minus one over Z plus one, all of that. So I substitute it inside of here. And then simplify it. You simplify it down and you don't make any mistakes. You line up, um, you should line up with something looking like this. And then what we what we do is to normalize. Normalize means that we take this, whatever this number here is, and make that one. So the answer should be one minus something, something, something. So I have to divide the whole thing through by 58,374. Don't let these big numbers scare you. That's the kind of numbers that happens in, in the discrete domain, when, you, you, when you're creating any, any sort of reasonable filter, you're going to get some very strange and very large numbers, all right? So don't let that worry you. So if you, if you um, divided it through, you would finally get an answer looking like this. Of course, um, the standard form is to express it in the form Z minus one, um, Z minus two, Z minus three, and so on. As you will see, if you stop your answer at this point here, let's say you run out of time and stop the answer here, all you will be losing is two points by not simplifying it. Okay, so with a 10 mark part, you would have had eight here. And if time runs out, rather than losing more marks from another question by wasting your time trying to get it down, right? If you don't have the time, stop here. You have eight out of 10, go ahead. When, when, when you finish the other questions, you can always come back. All right. Some people standardize by 
uh, in this exam are standardized by making this number one instead of this one, All right? It's not a standard form, but I accepted the answer, okay? And some, um, while I'm at it, somebody had asked about the scaling factor in the notes. You remember I had pointed out that when you do the designs that you frequently have to amplitude scale. Unfortunately, you can't get, you, 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 you don't know you have to amplitude scale until you actually plot the response and see what the DC value is supposed to look like. The DC value, the normalized DC value is supposed to be one. So if you, when you plot your answer, you do a frequency response plot of the answer, then you see what the DC amplitude looks like. You have to divide it accordingly to get an amplitude of one, all right? Our technique here stops a little bit short of that because we, we, we have an amplitude scaled here as yet, all right? So that was the third question. Um, I think somebody had put on uh, online. Um, so let's go back to question. So that was question four. And question five, now two part one had to do with one signal, um, the signal generator, how to generate a cosine and a sine and so on. All right, and, and the representations for that, that was in waveform generation. And remember what how this works is that if I want to generate a cosine signal, what I need is a transfer function whose impulse response is a cosine. All right, so that once I put an impulse in, I get this, this, this cosine coming out. And then, so you look for the, 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 um, the transfer function that gives you, in this case, 30 hertz. So you go down here, all right? HZ is this. This is a, a, um, the, 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 the Z transform of, of of R and cosine omega naught N. Of course, to get a continuous sinusoid that doesn't delay, the amplitude coefficient R to the power N has to be one, R has to be one. So it's really just cosine omega naught N, right? HZ is this, omega naught of course is two pi F over FS, right? You're given that F is 30, that is what you want, and you're given that the sampling frequency is 150. So omega zero was two pi over five. You substitute it inside of here and you get point, um, point three zero nine. so that HZ was, this was the transfer function for it. And then you draw it out, um, the, the, the um, canonical representation of it, all right? You have two ways of doing it. Remember, you can put the, the negative values inside of here or and, and have possible positive signs here, or you could put the actual value inside of here and you have a negative sign. So up to you, okay? And you had um, how many marks for that? Eight. And then the last part had to do the impulse invariant design. So the impulse invariant design, you start off again with some, some filter whose um, response you know. From HS, you have to find the inverse Laplace transform to find HT. Once you find HT, you go from HT to HNT. So you sample. So if the sampling frequency is this, T is one over 100, which is 0 0.01. So when you get T, you get HT. And then wherever you have T in there, now you replace T with 0 0.01 N. And then you find the Z transform of that and then simplify the equation. So how that works, right? So you have HS here, of course, to find the inverse Laplace transform. I give you Laplace transform table. So once you get it in a standard form, in the table, there's a, the inverse transform for something looking like this, ES plus F <coughs> over S squared plus lowercase E plus lowercase F. And if you substitute in there straight from the tables, you're going to get that the A, that HT is 1.97 e to the minus 4.5 t sine this. Okay, or you could complete the square and do it. However, you are comfortable finding inverse Laplace transforms. Feel free to to, um, to do so. But the table has basically the information that you need inside of there if it comes up. T is 0 0.01, so you substitute wherever you see T here, you replace that by N 
over 100, all right, or 0.01 N inside of here. So this is now in the form A to the power N sine BN, and you look, you go into your Z transform tables. So the Z transform of this HZ is going to be in this form, and you evaluate sine B and cosine B and A. So if you do that, you get it, you get the answer looking like this. Of course, remember when you're evaluating sine and cosine, keep your thing, keep keep your calculator in in in, in radians, please. And that's the answer right there. Okay. As usual, this would have been, this is what, a 10 mark. This is 12 marks for this part. All right. I, um, I don't have the marking scheme here. But if you had if you had left the answer up to this point here, the second to last line, you have 10 out of the 12 marks available to you. After that, you just have two marks to simplify here again. Okay, so use your time wisely. If, you, if you're doing something and time seems to be running out, then um, you, 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 you can stop at a convenient point once you haven't made any errors up until this point. And if even you have, right, some numerical errors, you might lose a mark or two, but you have the majority. It's a technique I'm interested in and you get um, you get probably more than half, you get, you know, maybe two thirds of the mark, marks for correct technique. And then correct arithmetic and correct algebra will give you the correct, um, the, 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 the rest of the marks for a particular part. Yeah. All right, so, so everybody all right with that? All right, it covers everything that, 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 um, we have done, um, and let me see. Okay, this is a 2013. Let me see if there was anything. Nine, 10. 11, 12. Let me see if there's anything different in here, right? So this one is a more conventional type type um paper here, same sort of thing, right? Um um on on the the, the various representation forms and so on. Um, it's asking you. A little bit now, if how you rank them in terms of processing speed, memory, and storage. Um, the the spectrogram. This one gives you a spectrogram and asks asks you to interpret it. So if you look at the spectrogram, let's see what that one looks like. Right. Remember what the spectrogram is showing you. It's showing you um, here's frequency, here's time, and it's showing you the amplitude. So. The brighter the color, the higher the amplitude. So if I were to give you something like this, you notice at, at time zero, the frequency is somewhere down here. At time one second, the frequency has gone up. At time 1.6 sec seconds, the frequency has gone up. So it seems that as time goes on, the frequency of this signal is increasing constantly or in a linear relationship with time, right? So this is what the spectrogram is telling you. So if I the, the question asks, well, what, what you could say about that signal? This is a signal whose frequency content increases uniformly with time, right? It's a straight line increase. As time goes on, the frequency in, in, increases. In fact, we have signals like that. We call them chirp signals. So, so it starts low and it goes up to a high frequency, right? You can even get it from, from some of the oscillators that we have in the lab, okay? Right, so this one, let me go back to it. So, um, you know, different ways of asking similar things. Um, what is a spectrogram here again? How you interpreted that? Well, I told you that. All right. Right, quest figure 2C. Right, so again, if I give you this, 
right? If I if I give you something like this and I told you that this was two signals and I did an FFT and I got this, um, what would be the explanation? What would cause this kind of behavior? From what you know, what sort of, um, what would call, cause, if it was two signals and nothing else, right? If I did the FFT correctly, I should only have two spikes, but I'm having a number of things of course, yeah. well, well, um, what are some of the reasons that that would happen? Or the main reason that this happens? Leakage, exactly, right? So this is happening because of leakage. And then now we have to explain well exactly what, what leakage is. And leakage arises because the bin spacing doesn't coincide with the actual frequency content of the signal. So if that is the case, when, when, when the FFT is done, the answers that the FFT um, 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 displays will not match any of the bin values and in fact will spill between bins or, or leak or spread, right? So the actual answer is going to look like this and the only way to simplify, you can't eliminate that because if you have a fixed number of samples and a fixed sampling frequency, then you can't, um, once you have the data gathered, you can't change that any longer. The only thing that you can do now is to apply something like a sampling window to it, and the sampling window will reduce the leakage um, a bit, but it will not um, it will not entirely eliminate it. And also, we saw another technique too. If 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 I have this and I were to apply something called the the a periodogram to it which basically is the square of the magnitude. What is going to happen is that the actual signal component side, this one whose amplitude is 12, and this one whose amplitude is 16, is going to become 144 and 16 square, whatever that is. So it's going to distinguish itself greatly from the smaller ones. Two will become four and so on. So you're going to see a, a dramatic increase in the actual signal values as compared to the um, the, 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 the ones that were produced by leakage, right? So you have sort of two ways of, 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 of manipulating the data. And, you know, one is to, to reprocess it using a, um, a spectral win window. The other way is to use an entirely different tool, which is after you get the FFT like you have here, you then run up, um, you then squ magnitude square the amplitudes, which, was, which is what the periodogram is about. It also divides it, it also averages it out. So the, the actual signal components become very obvious in, in, in these sort of cases, okay? In other cases, it's not, not quite as clear, but it does give you a much better picture of what, um, what, what, what the true situation is. As usual, you cannot say, for instance, the bin spacing on, on this one, what was it? The, the question asked, what was the, let me see. Uh, right. A 32 point and the sampling frequency was 18,000, 1800 hertz, sorry. So the bin spacing is 1800 divided by 32. So you can look at this, but of course the values, if it's 1800 divided by 32, this is DC, this is 1800 divided by 32, which will be the bin spacing. This will be twice that, three times that and so on. You all you can do at this point, like for instance, this one with the highest, this one and this one, you can say what bin, what frequency according to the bin value it is. You cannot tell me that this is a 200 hertz signal, all right? <clears throat> you will tell me whatever the actual output of the FFT is. That is, that is what the answer is. Yeah. All right. And the, the um, let me see the, the, okay, this is the solution here. Let me go back to, where was I? Right. Okay. And the rest of the questions are similar, similar type questions. They're moving average, um, window functions, why you use moving, why you use window functions and so on. Right, as Amanda said, they, you, you, you're trying to use the window functions here to, to stop leakage and you describe what the window function is and the criteria that they consider for the selection of a window function, right? How wide the main lobe is and how much the, the subsequent lobes get attenuated. All right, um, 
Well, this one was you you could design a, an FIR filter, seven point, the usual um sort of um, um calculation here. This one, you give me one low pass filter and you ask to use it two techniques to, to sorry, one analog prototype low pass filter and you're using the two infinite impulse response techniques that we learned to derive a, a suitable um, digital filter, all right? So again, it covers the same sort of material around. So um, um, I don't know how many, well, hopefully by now the exam is still on Monday. They, they didn't shift that around at all. So um, hopefully by, by now you've been doing the questions and, 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 and getting some answers and so on. I put up last year's paper online today with a solution as well too. So you can um, see how, how well, the most recent paper, how it looks like. It's the same, same topic content, same type of questions and so on. All right, so multiple types of the same, multiple examples of the same type of questions. Just look carefully. Um, there are a couple of things you have to commit to memory in order to, 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 to solve it, the, the problems and so on. And, and that's it. If, if, um, I think it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and um, your, your biggest thing is, is just to use your time wisely. So um, any, um, I wouldn't go through all the questions, all, all the papers, because they're the same sort of thing and you have the solutions here. So let me open up the floor again. Any, any particular concerns that you all have at this point? Right, from those of you who, who have been doing it, I mean, the classes, there's, there's 24 people strong. I'm seeing um, eight, well, eight, eight people here. So, But um, from the things that you have um, attempted so far, anything um, not making sense? If you get a, a very different answer, please let me know. Right, send me, send, send me it. Um, just send me a, a, a little scan of it or a screenshot or whatever it is that you have. Um, just send me and I'll I'll respond as as quickly as I can. Okay. So any concerns? We all right. Yeah. No. Maybe. Okay, all right for now, all right for now, okay. I'm glad who, um, most of you all had that pretty uh, more than decent marks coming in to the midterm, so, so we should be um, okay to go. Right, so uh, I will keep looking at the Google Doc. So if anything, um, if something is making sense, no, something for clarification, just put it there and I'll, I'll, I'll respond as quickly as I can, right? Or um, send me an email or, or you know, so anything that got, got my attention and I'll respond as quickly as I can. All right, we have, a, um, we still have, well, we have tomorrow, Friday, Friday, Saturday, even Sunday and so on. In between, I'll be checking all, all the way through up until the night. So so if you may need some some last minute clarification on anything, I'll, I'll try to answer, okay? All right, well, you keep revising if there are no more, more questions and so on. Um, you have all the past papers that you could need and all the solutions. And um, that's it, anything that comes up, just, just let me know. All right, if there's something really, really, really drastically wrong somewhere, um, well, bring it to my attention as quickly as you can. Okay? All right. All right, so, so, that's it, folks. Um, nice dealing with you, and and good luck if 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 the next time I see you happens to be um, on on Monday morning. All right, so take care. Let me stop the recording.